Namaste, welcome to season three, episode 12 of TT Talks. My name is Suhas and today we have a special guest. Vasugi Kailasam. And so Dr. Kailasam, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name is Vasugi Kailasam. I am an assistant professor of South and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. And I specialize in Tamil studies. Now, Tamil studies is actually a discipline that's kind of a smaller, you know, subfield within South Asian studies. What it involves is basically, you know, a study of um, the Tamil language and literature. There's also folks um, who work on history, culture, and stuff like that, politics, you know. So it's it's a small subfield within South Asian studies, but it's actually quite a thriving field. That's awesome. And so what, just before we get into that, uh, what part of India are you from? And um, just tell us a little bit about your history as well. Okay, so I was born in Chennai, in Tamil mm-hmm. Nadu, and I grew up there. So I spent the first 22 years of my life in India. Um, I spent 21 years of my life in uh, Chennai, and then for a year, I worked in Google, actually in Hyderabad. <laughs> and then, you know, I decided the corporate world is not for me, mm-hmm. and I really wanted to, you know, plunge into academia, and then I moved to uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies, which mm-hmm. is in London. It's one of the colleges under the University of London. So I went there and I did a master's in comparative literature. And the comparative literature aspect involved literatures of Asia and Africa, something that's also quite you know, uncommon because when you think of comparative literature as a discipline, it's very Eurocentric. So you're mm-hmm. comparing things like French and English, uh, French and German, things like that. Mm-hmm. Right? So SOAS, uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies, was one of the first uh, places to introduce a non-Eurocentric um, graduate program like this. So I was lucky to be um, a part of that. And you know, from then there was no looking back. I definitely wanted to, you know, get into academia. And then I went to do a PhD in the National University of Singapore, where I did uh, my thesis on Sri Lankan English and Tamil literature with a bigger focus on the Tamil aspect of Mm -hmm. um, Sri Lankan literature. Gotcha. And so, so was there any experience or some type of moment that you wanted, that you realized you wanted to specifically focus in your heritage specifically? So like Tamil heritage? Yeah, you know, I was looking at your questions and I was (laughs) kind of thinking back to this question that you had. Was there ever a time you were not, you know, comfortable with Tamil? Mm -hmm. And I think growing up, Um, you know, people would think that this is a diaspora story, but it's not. It's a very common story, even Mm -hmm. in Tamil Nadu, in a place like Chennai, where you have Tamil bombarded at you (laughs) everywhere. You know, you're in a Tamil-speaking family. That's Mm -hmm. the first kind of identity you are exposed to. But I was deeply, um, I won't say uncomfortable, but I would say that I was deeply attracted to other uh, spaces of belonging than Tamar. Mm-hmm. And the reason for this is mostly because of the kind of environment that I grew up in. My uh, parents were Tamil enthusiasts. My grandfather was um, a part of uh, the Dravidian mm-hmm. movement. He was a politician. Um, you know, Tamar was, was seen as something that, um, you know, was was... It, it really was something that we were taught to love, you know, from our birth. Mm-hmm. And when you're taught to love something, obviously, you also <laughs> get a sense of, you know, not completely identifying with it. Mm-hmm. it it's very forced at some level. Um, you're not curious. Mm-hmm. You don't know why you have to love it. So those things kind of stop me from really identifying myself or, uh, you know, being at home with Tamar. Mm -hmm. So I did Tamar uh, at school um, until my 12th grade, Uh which is, 
you know, which was already very, very hard for me because I really, you know, disliked how Tamar was, um, you know, one subject that was so differently structured from all the other subjects that you had in school. And one of the problems with the Tamar that we were taught in Tamil Nadu is also that, you know, it's just one subject mm -hmm. um, that you have uh, apart from all the other subjects. And of course, it's a very similar story, you know, languages and humanities are not given a kind of importance. Everyone wanted to be doctors or engineers. So in a sense, you know, just being um, in that Tamil class, for, you know, 40 minutes a day uh -huh. was also, you know, in a way not appealing because you were always thinking of, you know, why do I study this? Mm -hmm. Why does it matter? You know, it matters because you have to pass this. You have to have the subject in your transcript um, as something that, you know, you need to go to college. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a very it was a it was a very strange time where you know we had the best tamil teachers you will not find tamil teachers of that caliber now in tamil nadu but it was also a time where you know other forms of identity especially those coming from america or europe were more appealing mm -hmm. so lots of my friends and i we also enrolled in you know this place called alliance Frances. i don't know if you have that in uh, Georgia, but it's basically, you know, kind of a space where French is taught. It's a, I think it's a very Asian thing. Maybe they have a lot of it in uh -huh. um, Asia. So I, I actually have a diploma in French and I almost did a BA in French. <laughs> it was just, you know, the last minute I was mm -hmm. like, okay, maybe I should just do English because it's just something that's much more broader and French would limit me. Yeah. Um, so French actually was something I loved because there was a lot of literature that I felt I could access. Tamar, of course, there was a lot of literature. Um, it's a very old language, but a lot of the literature that people used to keep talking about was also older literature. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing that I found appealing or accessible about modern literature in Tamar when I grew up. So, um, you know, in that sense, it's it's also sort of um, strange to think of those times, you know, all through my growing up when I was in India, I was not really bothered, right, to find mm -hmm. out more. Uh, the time that I really started exploring Tamar was when I went to SOAS. Um, that was the first time that, you know, I also had a library which stacked all the different kinds of Tamil um, uh, books on modern, pre-modern, medieval literature. So it was really then that I was sort of fascinated and also got interested to explore more. And I was someone who was interested to explore the modern mm -hmm. um, Tamil literature, which is again something that not a lot of academics work on. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the research that we have in Tamil studies in terms of literature comes from either translation, you know, translating older texts or newer texts, or just working on pre-modern and medieval stuff. So in that sense i was uh that's how you know i really got to there and long-winded story to how you know uh at some point i was quite not at home with uh, -huh. uh Tamar. gotcha gotcha that that was yeah that was really fascinating that's like a different perspective than i've ever considered and I, it it's really it's really beautiful in a sense that you're able to utilize all these resources and be able to translate them into a modern context and i feel like that's what makes a lot of these ancient languages very unique compared to a lot of mm -hmm. the contemporary languages um mm -hmm. and so i speak telugu and so i a lot of my like relatives they're also interested in translating old telugu literature and so i really find it fascinating how a lot of the principles that you that are found in older literature can also be applied to modern day Right, absolutely. 
And you know, the thing about the past, especially for languages like Telugu or Tamil, is that you cannot take away their past mm -hmm. um, to, you know, really understand the present. The past is very, very important for both Tamil and Telugu in how they are so distinctive and they're so apart from, you know, Aryan languages. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the point where you ask, is the past weighing us down, right? Is the past really dictating how we can move forward? So I think there's there's a way in which you embrace the past mm -hmm. and you use it to understand the present. And that is sort of how I approach Tamar in terms of my teaching and research as well. Gotcha, gotcha. And so, so tying back to where your academic background, academia, uh, being at UC Berkeley and being in the hub of where a lot of um, Telugu and Tamil people like mm -hmm. stay. Um, actually, I'm from the Bay Area and before I moved to Georgia. Oh, okay. And so, I, so I, I learned and I saw a lot of like communities and a lot of like language learning facilities open up throughout my time in the Bay Area. And so what is your opinion about more and more people trying to get in touch with their heritage and their old languages? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was at this Tamil Diaspora Teachers Convention that happened this past weekend, and that was also the reason why, you know, I was a little slow in responding to your messages. Mm -hmm. But this um, convention was amazing. It basically brought together 200 Tamil teachers from around the world to talk about their experiences of being a Tamil teacher. Uh -huh. And they also had uh, students from the local Tamil community, uh, the ones that are attending Tamil schools to come and share their experiences of being a Tamil learner in the Bay Area. So I, I was really stunned and, and really also moved by the kind of enthusiasm that these folks have for language, mm -hmm. right? And I also say this from the perspective of someone who spent around 10 years in Singapore, mm -hmm. where Tamil is an official language. It's also a language that is supported by the Singapore government uh -huh. immensely in ways that are, you know, deeply tied to a kind of infrastructure building. So there is um, an opportunity for you to learn it in uh, school all the way from preschool to university. The government makes sure that you have access to your mother tongue. But here, that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. um, language endeavors are largely driven by these volunteer organizations. And I think it takes immense amount of planning, of, uh, you know, really mobilizing people to come together and do that. So I have a lot of, uh, you know, sort of, I, I'm really stunned by how they do it here. So, and I have a lot of admiration for that. Um, in terms of how this plays out, whether we actually find students from the Tamil schools coming to classes, for example, in Berkeley, mm -hmm. you know, we do, we have about 10 to 15 percent who come in uh, to our classes in the university. Mm -hmm. But again, you see um, the, the community, the Indian community in the U.S., I feel is largely dictated by a desire to send um, their children to professional sort of degrees, mm -hmm. right? So uh, one of the challenges that I foresee um, in the diaspora, especially the US diaspora, is to also think of how languages like Tamil and Telugu can be made attractive as professional languages or languages that can help you get something in the real world mm -hmm. right and i think this is where my perspective on singapore is is sort of helpful because in singapore you know you can really thrive being a tamil teacher mm -hmm. right um and this is again the support of the government the government makes sure that if you're a tamil teacher in a secondary school or in a junior college you are recognized for your work you are no lesser than any other teacher teaching in that school uh -huh. just because you're doing a mother tongue language. So I think there are all these challenges and perhaps, you know, we 
really need to see how these play out in the next couple of decades because the diaspora here is also very young mm -hmm. and i'm thinking of the dominant diaspora which is that of the tech diaspora mm -hmm. um you know people who moved here in the 90s or the late 80s um and i think that generation is still sort of young in comparison to you know the tamil diaspora in singapore malaysia which is much older mm -hmm. And so would you suggest that maybe introducing these mother tongue languages as like official courses in institutions would be um a good ish, good um intervention to introduce more students to these traditional languages or do you suggest that we do something else to perhaps introduce them in a different way Yeah you know I don't know how this will work because it really needs a kind of um you know a, a higher level thinking in terms of how do you structure uh, a a kind of professional path mm -hmm. to teaching language mm -hmm. right and i think it is really in the hands of the young this is where the young <laughs> people really come into um focus for me because i think you know even my generation um we have a specific understanding of language and identity and mm -hmm. i'm sure that a generation that comes after me like yours has a very different understanding of how language and identity works so i think what is interesting and what is really important at this point is to also get younger folks like yourself and i'm that's i'm so glad you're doing this podcast for that reason which we are also interested to talk about identity but perhaps not in the same way that you are thinking about it right mm -hmm. so i think these voices are what are important and i think these voices also need to be in spaces where they're taken you know as serious as someone who has experience of growing in the diaspora so i think um i don't know how how you know it will work but that is how i would uh, envision how language then sort of thrives and lives in the diaspora especially a space like the us which again as you know um you know it's not just one diasporic uh language it's mm -hmm. it's multiple languages so yeah yeah it's it's kind of a uh, a balance of everything and like you can't just push one language forward you have to bring the whole entire group together as well yeah and you know uh, i'm not i'm sure this happens in telugu spaces as well see tamil is not it is one language but mm -hmm. there are many communities within a tamil speaking world mm -hmm. right so for example i am an indian tamil right mm -hmm. i am a tamil from india but there are tamils in sri lanka there are tamils in singapore and malaysia there are tamils in mauritius there are tamils in europe um there are tamils in the us now all of these experiences are not one and the same mm -hmm. yes they do speak tamil but the way tamil is also spoken in these smaller communities is extremely different you know as an indian tamil um i find it difficult to understand uh chafna tamil which is a sri lankan um you know sub uh Dialect. branch of of tamil so there is a lot of experiences that are specific to um each of these spaces and i think what i also find um you know hard is how do you bring you know all these different people together yes tamil is what unites us mm -hmm. but the way one person inhabits tamil is completely different from another person's way of thinking about tamil so how do we acknowledge those experiences that's something to think about gotcha gotcha and so shifting the gears a bit um Could you explain to the audience a bit of your research projects such as um post-millennial Tamil vision cultures, visual cultures um and Tamil realisms? Yeah, so I'm currently working on two projects um and the first one which is my book project which is taking up most of my life right now <laughs> is basically um 
study of the Tamar realist novel. Um, mm -hmm. And in Tamar, it's the it's called Yadartavadam. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of Sanskrit roots. So um, I'm looking at how you know the realist novel becomes a kind of predominant genre um, after independence for India, Sri Lanka, as well as Southeast Asia. So I'm looking at how the Tamil novel, in a sense, you know, sort of thinks about realism and what is real um, across these spaces. So um, that's that's the you know the snapshot of that project. And mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at forty years. So I'm looking from. 1940s to 1980s and I stop with the 1980s because the 1980s is a time where lots of things uh, get changed in these spaces um, so I stop with 1980s I don't want to go into the technicalities <laughs> of it and bore uh -huh. you um, and so the visual cultures project is something that um, I've been working on for a couple of years you can find um, a couple of articles that I've published based on the project, um, if you Google it. So I have two articles out. One is on the neon noir Tamil film. Mm -hmm. So I look at how uh, Tamil cinema has become a space which has reinvented itself at the turn of the millennium mm -hmm. by looking at different kinds of uh, genres which have become popular like the noir which is very very uh, Euro-American centric uh -huh. um, and how you know Tamar cinema adapts these genres to its own context so that's one article the other one is about the rise of different kinds of mass heroes um, so when you think of mass heroes in the 90s you know they're mostly blue collared workers uh -huh. um, they're sort of you know, um, one with the people. So they are the, the kind of the uh, proliterate um, uh, kind of population. They are not really, you know, the bourgeoisie, uh -huh. right? So what I sort of argue is at the turn of the millennium, you have the rise of what an engineer hero, where heroes are more or less, um, contextualized as engineers right so what does it mean <laughs> when you say you know a person like a, a hero like surya uh -huh. is an engineer uh what does it mean when you see a hero like tanush in yeah. um La who's an engineer and that's the crux of the film right he's a La Patadari and uh -huh. he is a La Patadari because he's an engineer so i'm I, I was interested in looking at how this changes the texture of mass heroes and what we think of as the mass hero. So that's um, that's one article. But I hope to have a couple of others soon. And you know, I'm also interested in things like YouTube. Uh, how does YouTube and uh, some of the things that we constantly consume on YouTube, uh, like music videos, vlogs, mm -hmm. all of these sort of feed into our understanding of a kind of evolving Tamil identity. So, yeah. Well, that's really fascinating because um, actually my, me and my family watch Tamil movies all the time. And okay. so um, it's just seeing, and we, we actually watch it undubbed sub uh, because we, we think that actors and people in those movies do a better job of talking in Tamil, but then us just understanding what they mean. Like the emotions are more representative. And so, mm -hmm. and so what do you think, what is your opinion of these different Tamil heroes, such as Danush appearing in like the gray man or other, um, films that are much more targeted towards like the U S audience or a uh, Eurocentric audience? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, representation, um, I think has taken a huge different kind of dimension in the last couple of years. And I think we should be happy about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, folks like Danush, Maitre, I forget mm -hmm. her last name. Ramakrishnan, Ramakrishnan right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Maitre, Ramakrishnan, Mindy Kaling, all of these folks. I think um, it's important that we have South Asian representation. And I think it's also important we have uh, like a more South Indian 
um, slash whatever, you know, mm -hmm. folks that don't really identify as North Indian in their kind of ethnicity, um, moving across global spaces. So I think that's very important. Um, but I also think there is still a tinge of exoticism, right? When we cast these actors in, in sort of mainstream, um, you know, American Hollywood uh, mm -hmm. sort of spaces. So I think we need definitely to have more um, non-male identifying, you know, um, writers, directors, we need more of that for sure, because I still feel there's a kind of dominant heterosexual male, you know, sort of centric, male centric narrative that you can still trace across these representations. So mm -hmm. I think, um, I think it's good uh, that we have finally these faces um, out there, but I think still that there can be a lot more that can be done. Gotcha. And so me and my friends actually were talking about shows like Never Have I Ever and yeah. um, I think Matchmaking or Bridgerton. And so we considered it kind of like a double-edged sword because on one side you have these like different heroes from Bollywood, Tollywood and different media examples. But you also have kind of stereotypes attached to them because a lot of the characters in these movies, um, it's I'm not sure if the director wants to portray them this specific way or... Um, that's just how the character is. But a lot of there's a lot of stereotypes that remain with these characters. Like, for example, like my three mm -hmm. from Never Have I Ever wanting to get into Princeton and like wanting to be cool and all that. Um, like me and my friends were talking about this. And honestly, like that's not the reality for a lot of students here, because, um, yes, our parents focus like folk may ensure that we remain very involved in our academic scene. But we also are not like portrayed in that type of way. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's important, you know, uh, never have I ever is, whenever I say that in my classes, people are so excited that, <laughs> you know, we're going to talk about this. And I, I think a place like UC Berkeley seriously has a lot of um, identification, especially if you're South Asian with that show, because they all felt the pressure to get into a good school, you know, have uh, their life sorted in high school and so on so i mean about that show i i really you know i never felt it was a great show simply because i could not identify with it it's a very uh diaspora indian <laughs> indian diaspora centric you know a show about growing up and what i sort of felt uh, was interesting was that you know this is the kind of narrative that you've seen with um i don't know if you've ever encountered this writer's name, Meg Cabot. Um, she was extremely popular when I was growing up mm -hmm. in uh, India. You know, she did Princess Diaries, which was later made into a movie. So it's again about this high schooler, uh, you know, who wants to be cool, but she's not and so on. So it's the exact same narrative, right? Mm -hmm. What is interesting about Never Have I Ever is that it actually gives um, a space to bring in like other aspects of cultural identity that she would have not really thought about. So mm -hmm. that's the most interesting aspect of the show. But I agree with you in that it's a very uh, elite show in some senses because mm -hmm. it's also about a specific kind of Indian kid. Yes. Right? And um, it's also, I mean, people have talked about this, right? The cast angle in that show is really you know, archaic. Uh -huh. um, she's also, you know, the, the kind of things that you associate with that character, you know, really is is about a high caste mm -hmm. experience of living in Southern California. Yes. And um, I think those were sort of, you know, the kind of negative qualities of the show. But I agree that having like, a narrative like that, which is about a South Asian, uh, you know, woman growing up in a hyper competitive environment is, is a story that should be told. But again, what are the kinds of things that it leaves out is also important or it sort of just glosses over is also very important. 
Gotcha, gotcha. And do you, as um, as you're performing this project, have you noticed any media cultures or um, different examples of that are accurate examples of Tamil culture or South Asian culture? Mm, it's an interesting question. So I work uh, uh, a lot on Sri Lankan Tamil stuff. Right? Mm. So that was my thesis. But I've also remained sort of really interested in um, the Sri Lankan diaspora, <clears throat> especially the Tamil diaspora across Canada and Europe. And I think they are doing fascinating stuff. Like there are some, um, you know, projects, for example, that are happening on spaces like Instagram, um, which are, you know, really new. And they're also very inclusive in that they're really trying to think about different kinds or aspects of the Tamil identity, which is also about caste and class, right? These mm -hmm. are important. Not everyone has the same experience of moving to the diaspora, right? And not everyone is comfortable with their diasporic uh, identity in the same way that we assume that these characters in the shows that we see are. So I think um, there are lots of projects. I, I cannot think about like a film, for example, uh, maybe it's slipping my mind, but um, yeah, there's, there's still a lot to be done so far. And I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of stories that I need, that need to be told that are, that I hope, you know, again, one of the other problems with things like Netflix or Prime is they like these kind of mass appeal shows. It's not that... Um, you know, they also want to tell stories that are much more simpler. It's it's also about the sellability of these shows. So, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. And so shifting the gears a bit um, in an academic sense. So I, mm -hmm. I was reading your uh, website article and um, some of the courses that you taught, I believe, were Intro to Tamil Literature and the Realist Novel in South and Southeast Asia. So from mm -hmm. a student perspective, what is what are some things that you want your students to leave these courses with or like some understanding? Mm, you know, so I teach the introduction to Tamil literature almost uh, every other semester and mm -hmm. I just finished teaching it for the spring semester. Um, I think students really love it. Mm -hmm. um, one, because, you know, the kind of literature that I choose in that course is also modern. So it's very appealing to their own experiences. There are also things that the course really focuses on, like in terms of class, caste and gender, which are, you know, these big concepts that people don't really get to explore in a mainstream setting mm -hmm. through literature. So a lot of my students basically are not humanities majors, right? A lot of them are doing things like uh, engineering or they're doing uh, microbiology. They're really prepping for pre-med. They're really in the pre-med stage prepping for grad school. So for them, this class is kind of something that they don't get to explore in any other space mm -hmm. uh, in, in the university. So I think it's also a class which is very intimate in that people really at some point in the semester feel compelled to talk about their own experiences, which is what I really value and treasure about uh, teaching a subject like introduction to Tamil literature. You know, at some point, people start sharing their own ideas about Tamil identity, which is also what the course wants us to do. Uh, you know, it's really a space for talking about um, how we inhabit the spaces that we do in terms of our own cultural um, understandings. So, yeah. Gotcha. And have you had any students that are, are not traditionally Tamil, but they're just interested in the language? Yeah. Yeah. So every semester we have about, so usually the class is full, like 30 students. And mm -hmm. Um, that's the maximum um, I've taken for this class. Uh, out of 30, I would say about seven or eight routinely are non-Tamil. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a mix of 
you know, folks who speak other South Indian languages or other Indian languages. And in some cases, they are uh, not Indian at all or not South Asian at all. So I do have those kinds of students coming to the class as well. Gotcha. And do you place emphasis on teaching Tamil itself or the analysis of Tamil literature? So I don't do linguistics, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not my forte. Gotcha. Um, what I do is literature and culture and history. So I am more, you know, focused on the Tamil literary text mm -hmm. in this class, for example. So we do like close readings. Um, I also give them a lecture for every topic, just talking about the context for that particular literary work that we're going to read and so on. Yeah. Gotcha. And so what about your other course regarding the realist novel? Uh, the realist novel is actually a grad seminar, so I don't have um, undergrads in it. Mm -hmm. So the grad seminars are quite different in that these are really meant for, you know, very advanced PhD candidates. Um, uh, they already have like a research project. They're all humanities trained. Mm -hmm. I don't have anyone in that class who is not a humanities student. So it's a very different kind of teaching that I do for that class. So that's more theoretical oriented. We read a lot of um, journal articles. Um, we dissect, um, you know, the text alongside the journal articles and so on. Whereas the undergraduate courses are a little more relaxed also because, you know, people do not have a humanities background, mm -hmm. at least 60% to 70% mm -hmm. of the time. So, yeah. Gotcha. And so actually, this is a question I had from when we were talking about Tamil realisms. Um, what is the realist perspective? Uh, you have to read my book for that. <laughs> but, you know, um, so this is this is one one question that I ask in the book, right? Like, what is realism? What is Yadartavadam? So something that's real to you might not be real to me, right? And the way we look at the world can differ so drastically. But I think what is interesting about realism as a kind of aesthetic style is that this is what people wanted to embrace uh, in the coming of modernity, right? So people did not want to, say, for example, think of, uh, you know, texts like the Ramayana or the Mahabharata, which is not realist right there is a sense in which this is mythology this is a kind of writing which is um almost fable like mm -hmm. but then when you think of um the 20th century where people are more in tune with understanding the world around themselves and the complicated nature of humanity realism becomes the kind of aesthetic style that they want to go towards, right? And um, there's a lot of work that has already been done on South Asian realism, but there's been virtually none on Tamil, right? So that's my sort of foray into it. Um, so I'm really interested in how realism begins to take shape in the 20th century and then continues to till date, right? Even mm -hmm. today, we keep thinking of the good, um, uh, sort of the more successful, the more uh, popular, uh, you know, cinematic text, for instance, as being more real, mm -hmm. right? This is more real uh, than whatever came before it. So I think there's a way in which Yadartam or realism is a, a very appealing aesthetic style that has stretched across the decades. So I'm really interested in what are the stakes of it, if you want to think about it in terms of a realist um, portrayal of gender, a realist portrayal of caste, a realist portrayal of space, right? So I'm sort of in the book looking at separate categories like that through the umbrella term of realism. Gotcha, gotcha. I hope that sort of makes sense, but yeah. It's a, it's a very abstract topic. I, I definitely want it to check is. out your book. Um, yes. But yeah. that's, that's also another big question that you're asking the audience about what you consider real and how that might differ from another individual. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So just another personal question. What are some struggles that you have faced in your journey of academia? Academia is as unequal as any other space, right? Let's mm-hmm. just get that straight. Um, it's not It's not that space where you are for the rest of your life, writing and thinking about things that matter to you. <laughs> um, you know, you do, I think you do get to do a little bit of that and that's the real value in the profession, but there's also a kind of hierarchy to it. Um, mm-hmm. It is, uh, to begin with, you know, I don't know if you've read this particular article that came out, I think last year, um, I think it came out in um, Inside Higher Education, which had a survey of tenure track professors. And it said that uh, around 22% of tenure track professors in the US have parents, like two parents, right, mm-hmm. with a PhD and they have some experience in academia. So um, it's also a profession that I think is is extremely hard in the kind of toll it takes on your younger years, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to be in grad school for like eight years. And then if you have a postdoc, that's the ninth year. And then hopefully you get a job and jobs are evaporating like crazy right now with the economy um, and so many other factors, the way the institutional uh, setup is now evolving in the United States where, you know, um, the university prefers to have um, adjunct faculty over permanent um, faculty or tenure track faculty. So it's it's already very hard to get a foot in the door. Mm-hmm. And I think I did face that quite a bit also because, you know, my training has never been in the United States. Um, I was trained in NUS uh, in Singapore. And so my way to come to UC Berkeley was also sort of long winded. Um, There is also kind of uh, American centeredness to humanities uh, in the way it's practiced here. So I think it's much easier if you go to like an Ivy League school, have a famous advisor, and then that it's it's so much more easier for you to get into the game. Um, so some of my struggles were really about just getting a foot in the door, mm-hmm. you know, and also my family is not um, from a kind of academic background by any means. My father was an engineer, he later went on to do some business. And then uh, my mom was a ho- homemaker throughout her life. She never went to college. So, you know, it's it's also that kind of struggle where people don't understand why you're spending so much of your life <laughs> doing this when you can be doing something else. And like I said, I did have a job in Google, which I could have just stuck with, but I, you know, did not. So yeah, so those were some of my struggles. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, as we're slowly wrapping up this podcast, what are some steps that can be taken to ensure that future generations of South Asian individuals are able to keep in touch with their culture and traditions? Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, sort of engage with your identity, right? It doesn't need to be an engagement of love all the time. <laughs> It does not need to be an engagement of adhering to what your elders say Mm -hmm. about what you should do to love a language. Just engage with it. Um, It doesn't need to be through language. I want to make that very clear. You know, I think there is a kind of long-standing argument that, you know, if you don't speak, for instance, Tamil, then how can you call yourself Tamil? Mm -hmm. But I think there are different ways of, of engaging the language. Um, and also, you know, if you don't speak proper Tamar, yeah, then you're not Tamar enough, right? So the litmus test for, <laughs> you know, being Tamar is speaking grammatically correct um, Tamar. So I think a lot of us don't have that mm-hmm. access. A lot of us also don't have that privilege. So let's be... Um, you know, really 
open about it. Um, I think engage with language in whichever way you can. If you can speak Tamil, speak it how much ever you can, uh -huh. in whatever way you can. Um, if you, uh, you know, think some aspect of your identity is interesting to you, pursue it, right? Don't give it up. And I think just be open, right? Just be open to um, thinking about identity. And I think that's something that needs emphasis, uh, right? And a lot of it is also very received uh, in terms of our own ideas of languages and cultures and so on. So, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. And so what are some long-term goals for, that you have for yourself in like a, it can, in, in any sense, like an academic sense, social sense, personal sense? Um, I think, you know, I definitely want to work on topics that have not been worked on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also very interested in things like gender. So I foresee at some point a project on gender. I'm also very interested in exploring parts of uh, Tamil identity that have never been given a kind of center stage, right? And for example, you know, what about Southeast Asian Tamil identities, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is a very big field in places like Singapore or Malaysia, but it's never really talked about in a mainstream academic setting in Tamil studies. So. I really want to explore things like that. Um, and you know, the, the tragedy of literary studies in Tamil studies is that there is so much you can work on. Maybe there's just not enough time, right? So um, I also am very committed to trying to build, um, you know, a network of scholars. So hopefully I will get a lot more PhD students in the future who want to explore um, modern Tamil literature and culture. So I'm really sort of committed to that and building a kind of community that can hopefully also go into the real world. Mm -hmm. And I really love working with the community, right? Uh, that's something that I, I think I'm, I'm quite invested in. I like to, um, you know, get involved in community projects and so on. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed once, um, the technicalities of, of being a tenure track person settles down, I can move more into kind of community projects. Gotcha. And so what are some things that you want the audience to leave from this podcast understanding? Hmm. You know, I really, really admire Suhas, your efforts to do <laughs> this. And I hope that, you know, folks listening to this podcast, they can take inspiration from you and your team to try and do this at a more grassroots level. And I think uh, it's very important that you, you know, create conversation and spaces for this kind of conversation to happen. And I think that's really what I want to leave the audience with. Really think of small things that you can do to make um, a difference to, you know, what you think is missing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's that's important. If there's something missing, then maybe you should be the one who's doing it, right? <laughs> not wait for someone else to do it. So I think I'd like to leave, with, leave everyone with that kind of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, def like interacting with a lot of our students and other podcast guests. I've, I've mean my friends, we've noticed how people express and learn culture in different ways. And it's not necessarily a template format for everyone. Um, and so that's, exactly. that's something we want to emphasize as well. Like ac you could, of course, focus on the linguistics of a language. You can focus on the technicalities of a language, but also listening to media or certain examples, or even learning the historical context of where these languages are derived from is another way you could be invested in a language as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and, and, you know, I really hope in the next decades, we will have more universities teaching language, especially South Asian languages at the tertiary level. Mm -hmm. And if you have an opportunity to do it in your universities, please do it. You know, this is also another thing that I want to say that if you ever have an opportunity to learn Telugu or Tamil anywhere, 
uh, make sure you enroll yourself in that, although it might interfere with your whatever bigger, you know, um, uh, you know, commencement related sort of, um, uh, you know, guidelines, you know, related to your degree and things like that. Just enroll because this is also important. The more number of students we graduate in learning a particular language is important for universities to take note of and then offer that to much wider, you know, populations. So that's something that people should also do if they can. Of course. Well, that that's 100% accurate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Kailasam. Um, we no really problem. appreciate, we really appreciate having academic individuals and people who have gone, uh, through so much to, and are so invested in their mother tongue and which we want to hopefully spread to, um, our students and our friends as well. Um, it's, it's really valuable for us and thank you so much. Thank you. And I wish you all the best with continuing the podcast. And I, I, I think you do have fairly regular podcasts, right? So all the best. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.